Welcome to season three of Outstanding Women Leaders, Witty and Wise Conversations. I'm your host, Katie L. Eads, founder and chief OWL at Outstanding Women Leaders, OWL Professional Coaching, an organization dedicated to empowering women leaders to rewrite their story and reconnect to fulfillment and joy. OWL is on a mission to host 100 million Witty and Wise Conversations that disrupt the way leaders think and inspire the world to live in, a, in relationship with each other. We have four rules for our conversation today. Nobody gets to be wrong. Nobody gets to be right. Everybody gets to be vulnerable and everything is included. We do not edit here. Whatever is meant to be in this podcast is what is supposed to be here in this moment. We've also asked our guests to join us via video so we can connect. Eyes are the window to the soul. You will be seen here. You'll be heard. There is space for you. When this conversation comes to a close, I will ask our guests three questions. If you've tuned in before, you know what they are. And if you haven't, you don't want to miss them. But enough about me. Today, I'm excited to welcome the outstanding woman leader, Rachel Fisher from the Ritual Movement, theritualmovement.com, if you want to search her out. Rachel is an integrative health and mindset coach with a broad background in psychological science, yoga, functional strength and conditioning, holistic nutrition, and farm to table cooking practices. Rachel has a knack for empowering you to transform your habits, weave intention into your daily doings, and realize your true potential. A PhD dropout turned applied practitioner. During her time in academia, she studied extensively the areas of self control, goal pursuit, and well being. That curiosity sparked a desire to get on the ground level and make a personal difference. Since that pivot, Rachel's been weaving the tapestry that is her current approach to mindset, movement, nutrition, and connection with the ritual movement. Rachel's passion and calling is to co-create rituals together, to walk beside you as you lovingly release old patterns, ground in your body, become clear on your core values, develop trust in yourself, and experience the full tilt transformation of which you are oh so capable and worthy. Welcome, Rachel. So excited to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much. It's so good to be here. It's so good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you again. I first met Rachel through CrossFit. So we are the like OGs of Chicago CrossFit back when it first started and uh, well, not first started, but first opened in Chicago, right? The mem Were you a member of the very first gym? Um, so it was always a debate kind of between uh, CrossFit Chicago and I think it was Windy City. Yes, that's right. Argue who that's was right. first. Yeah. And I was three, one, two, what's up South loop. Yes. <laughs> West loop. Where were they? At? I was in the South loop. They were in the West loop. Um, and <laughs> I've gotten to know you over the years. When I own the gym. You are our supplement provider. You've had quite an amazing story. I'm so grateful for you joining us. Uh, and I want to dive in and just start with, I love that you have called it ritual design versus habit design. So many people want to create habits and how do we have it stack and atomic habits and all the habits um, where I always look at habits are unconscious things where rituals are very intentional. Tell us all about um, ritual and why that's so important. Yes, uh, such a great place to start. And I'm so glad you gave kind of a shout out to James Clear's Atomic Habits because I love, 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 love his stuff. And I love how tactical it is. I like to think that I kind of take pieces of, you know, his really science and research-based approach, because that's my background too, mm -hmm. and just add an air of, I wouldn't say a zhuzh, but an air of just some soul to it and some more, um, you know, he talks about identity, but really tying into what your vision is for your life and what your values are. So while habits are really automatic, you know, they occur over time, they, they started somewhere, um, but over time, they've just been these deep grooves that we've worn in our brain and our neurocircuitry. And so, you know, the way we pour our coffee in the morning, the way we tie our shoes, the way we drive to work, if we need to drive to work anymore these days, um, we don't even think about it because it's on autopilot. And this is really adaptive for us. You know, this helps us have shortcuts in life um, that we need. Otherwise, we would be overthinking all the time. We'd just be so busy thinking. Where it becomes an issue is when these habits are bumping up against what it is we currently want for our lives when it's no longer you know it served us i'm sure it one of course it served us at one point and it serves some part of us today most likely some part of us that feels really comfortable and safe because we this is what we know 
Um, but there's some aspect when people come to me at least where they are, it's just not working for them. You know, sitting down after a long day of work and having two, three, four glasses of wine just isn't really cutting it anymore in terms of how they want to feel um, or how they want to look or how they see themselves. And so what rituals are, they're simply habits or practices. So they could be things that you do um, each day or like something that you do re uh, every once in a while that are anchored to your vision and your values. Okay. So they're really intentionally designed habits and, and practices. And do some of them become a little bit more automatic? you know, over time, um, particularly the ones that you want to the ha the ones that you want to enact every day. Sure. Yes. Um, but at first, as you're creating them, there is always as over time, um, not just over time, but at the beginning as well, just really anchored on who it is you want to be and who you know yourself to be deep down. Mm. Um, so many good nuggets there anchored to vision and values. You know, a lot of the habits that I have where clients come in and want to build these new habits are really anchored. And well, this is going to make me more productive, or this is going to make me a better leader. And it's so important that you have that flashlight really shined on the vision and values and the intention behind why they're starting to create them. I love that. Yeah. At the, one of the first things I do, whether I'm working with a group um, or with individuals, um, or even just like one time, like a workshop, I have people go through a guided visualization meditation, you know, where I take them on a journey to meet this version of themselves that they know, you know, I, I use the work of embodiment practices. So breath work, um, as well as grounding in your senses and really calming the nervous system down. So you can feel safe enough to really access those parts of you that know you the best and aren't like completely overstimulated by what's happening in your life that day um, or what's on your mind and really getting clear about who that version of yourself is. Um, so the vision is a really important place to start. We have to compare some notes on how, what visualization we both do for our clients on getting to yes. know their wiser elder self. Uh, so Rachel, you started out in psychology and you learned all about self-control uh, as a diagnosed ADHD person, you struggle neurodiverse, I think is our word now. I don't know, but it, I can that tell is. you that self-control is challenging. And one of the areas of ADHD that people don't realize it's so challenging with self-control is food. If I am in the room, I don't care how full I am. I want the largest piece of cake. Mm. I probably want your piece of cake too. That is just how my brain is wired. And yet I've lost the 60 pounds. I've developed the self-control. And so I under, I have my own personal journey, but I'd love to know, uh, tell us everything we need to know about self-control and the psychology behind it. Oh my gosh. That could be like a, a whole, uh, lecture series, but I'll tell you my story. First of all, like amazing that you about your journey and how like I know I've talked to you with, with you about it before but it's just so inspiring anybody anytime anybody whether you know it's you a friend of mine a client you know it's anytime I hear the story like that it's just like gives me more motivation it's like yes like we are able to shift you know we're not stuck in these ways of being so I just want to acknowledge you for that oh, thank you um of course for me you know we were chatting a little bit before this started, you know, it's whenever it's, it's not research, it's me search is what mm -hmm. we say in academia, right? We don't, we don't teach, we don't teach necessarily uh, what we have, but what we want, right? So I've definitely struggled with self-control and um, I come from a family that is pretty steeped in addiction um, from anywhere from alcohol to sugar to heroin actually lost my sister to an overdose um, from, in like 2016. So it's pervasive through my family. And ever since I was little and I watched the people in my life struggle with addiction, I've always been really curious as to the underlying motivations behind it, how it happens. And I know addiction might seem like a, a one brush away from self-control, but they're so related. And I, and I think of them as very intertwined because it's one of my core beliefs that we're all addicted to something, right? That makes us going back to that 
something that makes us feel safe or something that makes us feel comforted or something that just takes a little bit of protects us from something in our in our reality you know at the moment so i like to look at um our addictions and the things we struggle with self-control is as allies in a way as much as they've been many of our demons um because they teach us about ourselves and what's protected us at certain periods of our life so my own personal addictions uh there's a few the one that i've struggled with the most has been sugar sugar and me it's like it's what comforts me when i'm feeling really really stressed out it has been like the escape from reality so for the longest time you know and including when i was in graduate school up until very recent years until um shortly after uh, the passing of my sadly the passing of my sister when i was really forced to examine this um in a great detail i would eat very clean quote unquote clean throughout the week very restrictively honestly and when it would come time for the weekend i had gotten in the habit of going to the store and getting enough sugar donuts you know trigger warning everyone donuts cupcakes cake whatever it was plopping myself in front of a television because i couldn't bear to have something like just sit there in silence and be with just my food i had to just even distract myself from what i was doing cuz i had so much shame around it and i would just sit and i would eat until i was frankly uncomfortable most of the time sometimes just like could barely even want to turn over and then go to sleep you know lull myself into a sleep and that pattern repeated itself for gosh katie like i'd say 10 15 years and no one would know it like thankfully in some ways like because i exercise so much you know i appear like a fit person on the outside you wouldn't guess walking down the street i'm a health coach i was health coaching you know as this was going on so imagine the sense of integrity that felt like was missing the sense of inauthenticity that i i that i think a lot of us walk around with but i certainly felt it and i said there's got to be there's got to be another way you know to live life more authentic to who i am and gosh i'm going to learn how to do it and i want to teach people how to do it and so that was how i think that bridge came from my story that's ever evolving like all of ours right into into finally starting the ritual movement Mm. Yeah, you're speaking my language with sugar because giving up the breads and going paleo and all of that was harder, but I felt so much better. Turns out I'm allergic to dairy. So there was this in, there was this incentive for me to avoid those things. But that um ingrained habit, the ingrained ritual really of turning to closet eating donuts which is what i call it where uh we hide the evidence of what i ate uh cuz i was married at the time and i would go and pay in cash so that <laughs> there was no receipt of the $25 of donuts that i just ate and professional very professional very savvy um <laughs> i kind of made up the part with cash i don't really know that i did that <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Hey, hey, but we do that. We hide it. We hide it. Like But I certainly I, had the evidence of eating it. I certainly if I ate all the chocolate and really oh shit, like I ate this, I would go make sure I replaced it so that it was, you know, there was no evidence. And as a kid, it was one dessert. You always got the one dessert. And I remember sometimes wanting to sneak another dessert, but I always had to ask my parents kept tabs on those. And I was the only child, so they would know if I ate it. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we talk about addictions. Yes, everyone has addictions, and oftentimes the stigma is around some addictions are healthier than others. Your addiction to working out. Well, that's a great addiction. You're healthy. Um, and the number one addiction I see everyone has is we are addicted to suffering in some ways. Mm. we really do as uh, as humans our brains love to prolong <laughs> the suffering and um it isn't that a sugar addiction is different than a marijuana addiction or an alcohol di- addiction when they are causing us to i mean we're we're not in alignment with our authenticity i was oh, i owned a gym when i was eating these donuts in the closet um we are not you know we're we're suppressing we're hiding something the addiction is covering up a hurt 
or a pain. And sometimes those addictions are still healthy. So where, where, how do you help people with a ritual movement that is, you know, is not just swapping out one addiction for another. Cause I will tell you, I got to the point where my addiction was, Ooh, I made it till two o'clock. I won't eat till seven. Um, because then I could eat more calories in the small little window and pass out. You know, how do you help people create, um, rituals, <laughs> not addictions, yeah. new addictions, right? That's a very great question. I think part of the process that I think is so important is building that self-awareness um, and then honesty about that self-awareness. Um, so we talked a little bit about the visualization exercise. It's so important. You know, so many coaches use these with their clients. It's such a powerful tool, but really getting clear about who you want to be. And then also, like you said, it's so important, so valuable, the addiction to suffering that a lot of us have. So getting honest about what our beliefs are. And sometimes we don't even know they're kind of subconscious. And so what I often do with clients is journaling exercises, for instance, with powerful questions that me like, particularly around what they're working on. So like, for instance, if someone has, you know, the really common goal to lose weight, I might ask, <clears throat> okay, well, like, where did your beliefs around what the proper weight come from? Like, what does it mean to you to be a certain weight? What kind of person are you if you weigh this much versus, you know, this? And they can start to hear their self-talk. They can start to hear um, where they might be tying up their own worthiness as a person, really, on what they weigh. And so often, that's not even coming from who they are. It's coming from, it's, it's never coming from who they are. It's coming from what we've been taught as a society. It's been com coming from what their parents were taught by their parents, this thing that we've been passing along to each other. And I feel like people are finally starting to just drop on the ground and go, oh, that's not for me. Cool. You know, so I think that self-awareness piece is really important for helping um, prevent that kind of adoption of some other form of some other form of suffering really, right? Um, and I think going with them along the journey and keeping it reflective and navigating those waters when things seem like they might be going overboard, meaning like it's going into addiction territory, it's going into, um, I'm only worthwhile if I do this, working mm -hmm. together, working together on the self-examination and the self-talk, you know, how compassionate are you being toward yourself in this moment? You know, are you using this new habit that you've had to help make up for some perceived um, unworthiness in yourself because you gave a talk that didn't go how you hoped at work that day or, or something, an argument with, with a partner. Yeah. When you talk about that self-awareness, you mentioned that the overdose of your sister, I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank that you. really was sort of that catalyst that had to create you becoming a little bit more self-aware. What did you have to uncover about you to, to mm. let go of the sugar? Uh, it's still, still being uncovered. I, I think, I think that's a great question. You did say before we started, one of your master, one of your, one of your superpowers is asking really good questions. So that's a great one. Let me think about that for a second. What did I uncover about myself? That I, I, I really just wanted the world to see that I'm invincible. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I've got, I've got my shit together. I can handle it. You know? So you I had something to prove. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I absolutely had something to prove and I was willing to hide whatever it was at all costs. And just being able to talk about this, you know, with clients, with you right now, you know, being able to share this, is is part of that healing process for me is part of like hey because that's one of my fears having grown up surrounded by addiction is like what if that becomes me you know what if i and so i was like put face to face with it something like, oh. to prove once again <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. and so i think i think actually getting a chance to look at it everything square in the face see it for what it is and say 
And I think you're right. Like, I never thought of it this way, but when you put it like in terms of being addicted to suffering, the beliefs that I had about myself is just like, I'm an endurance athlete. So I was, I was a, an Ironman for a while, lots of triathlons. It's like CrossFit, like, oh yeah, I can, I can take whatever pain, you know, whatever it is. And, um, it's like, I have to, I have to have suffering to prove myself. And it's like, no, actually, um, this is actually continuing to contribute to my suffering and I deserve better than this. Like, this isn't actually an act of self-love, you know, it's comforting right now, but I know on the other side of this, I'm going to feel the self-love that I always talk about with people. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just kind of a, just a look in the mirror, like, Oh, I am, I'm just completely I was broken open by that experience. Yeah. Well, in all the training you do, I wonder if there's any awareness you had of like, maybe I need sugar Monday through Sunday. <laughs> Dextrose <laughs> is kind of important when you're exercising a lot. Oh, um, that's, that's a whole other rabbit hole. <laughs> we won't go down that one. Um, I know for me that my, like many addicts, um, my self-awareness was, um, this is something that can't be in the home. Mm -hmm. And one of my greatest challenges in the last two years has been cohabitating with someone who has a, um, take five Kit Kat or take five Reese's habit, which I, you know, happens to be one of the best chocolates I've ever had. Didn't exist when I gave up sugar last time. Um, oh. one of, yeah, my biggest self-awareness, uh, living in my own home was that whatever I bought, if I bought ice cream, I was going to have the entire container and I got, I definitely was at the point where I was okay with having a few bites and putting it back. But my addiction self-awareness is that I don't have a brain that's designed to be stronger than this and I don't have to. Yeah. Uh, so my ritual around treats is that we go out to get treats or we're on vacation and we seek out the best gluten dairy free donut shop that exists, whatever that may be. Um, and, but I can't have a little bit. And that's okay for me. I am not a, a addicted to having to suffer anymore by feeling like I'm deprived. Um, but I definitely spent a lot of time staring at cupcakes at parties and I won, I didn't have them, uh, but I wasn't fully present in the moment to be experiencing what was there. And that, yeah. um, that's been a new piece for me now is just bring as I'm staring at a cupcake or staring at debating whether or not to have something is to, to bring my attention to the present, to the person I'm having the conversation with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Cause that's all we want in that moment that we even want something like that usually is we want our own love and attention. Right. Yeah. So if you uh, can give that I want, to the, I want the dopamine hit from the sugar, darn it. My brain needs some of that. <laughs> yes, it is. It is pervasive and it's actually taken me where my slippery slope was, and this to people listening, this might sound restrictive. It would have sounded restrictive to me had I not had a mindset shift around it and like further understood the way sugar works in our, in our bodies and our brains, particularly my brain is like any sweetener whatsoever, like stevia, monk fruit, coconut mm -hmm. sugar, the things, honey, the things I've been like, oh, these are like locally sourced some of them. And they, they check all the boxes for me. If that touches my tongue, like I'm going to have cravings most likely. And so for me, and even flowers, like I've been gluten-free for a long time, but flowers, because of how refined they are, your, most of your audience might know this. I know you of course know this, but it like turns to glucose in your gut, like almost instantly into like your blood sugar. And so for me having kind of a slow kind of carb diet, like where I'm just eating a lot of nutrients. And just taking like the choice of it out of the equation for me doesn't feel restrictive to me. It actually ironically feels really freeing. So, so for me, the only way that's worked is like actually cutting all of the, like, why do I need additional sweetness beyond like what mother nature already gives me mm -hmm. in fruit? You know, why do I, why is this meal that I'm eating this delicious dinner? Why is it not good enough? Why do I have to have a chocolate cake afterwards? Like, so I've just really shifted my mindset around it and it's not for everybody. I understand that. But for me, that's how I've broken the shackles for my, yeah. my relationship with sugar. Yeah. Well, I mean, I realized when I, you know, if someone craves a cigarette after dinner, right, they're addicted to cigarettes. If you, if I'm craving uh, a dessert after eating a steak and a potato and broccoli, right. Then there, for me, that that's what, um, I think bothers 
bothered me about the addiction was that I, it, nothing was going to satisfy that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it wasn't about trying to fill a void at that point. It was a habit. It was a neural pathway that was very strong from a very young age. Cause my mom made sure we had dessert with every single meal. And, um, so that ritual for me was like, the dinner is not complete until you've had your sweet. Right. And that it's, it's, uh, I was able to get out of that for a while. And then I like said, I moved in with a man with Kit Kat habit and <laughs> advised the candy and, you know, you don't take alcoholics to bars because while they're still in recovery or while they're struggling or maybe not ever. Uh, and so some addictions, I don't find it restrictive because I know the store has it and I can walk two blocks to a store. I've just never wanted to walk two blocks to a store at nine o'clock at night after I had a meal. Right. Right. Which is usually when that, usually when that kicks in. Yeah. So so tell us a little bit about how people, how people can find you. Tell us a little bit more about your ritual movement coaching. Uh, You've got a one-to-one practice. You have current openings. Tell us all the things. Of course. Um, So the website is a really great way to read about me and a little bit more about my services. It's the ritualmovement.com, not ritual movement, (laughs) the ritual movement. And um, you can also find me on social media. I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, The handle there is just the ritual movement. Um, And so right now I do have some, I'm really focused on my one-on-one practice. I've got um, several clients I'm working with now, but I've got a couple of openings for the next, for the summer. And um, typically just to give you guys an idea, I work with folks for about three months um, minimum because it takes time to see changes, of course. And each relationship is custom created to the client and what their goals are. There is an emphasis around health. Um, Usually people come to me with a health goal, whether they're wanting to eat more whole foods and they're not sure where to start or whether they're trying to um, lower their blood pressure, you know, whatever it is, I work with, with folks individually to help um, form some rituals that are meaningful for them and that align with their life and help basically make their life look more like they, they, they envision it to be. Um, so it's one-on-one. That is um, probably my favorite way to work with folks. Um, I also uh, have recently opened up corporate coaching, corporate group coaching. So I've uh, been working with groups around 10 to 20 individuals. It's kind of the sweet spot with um, weekly Zoom meetings, tackling some of the same topics we do with individual coaching, but you've got the accountability and the support and the really rich dialogue uh, of the group. So that's also something I'm up to talking about as well. Yeah, since the pandemic, I think an emphasis for health and wellness and companies is so needed right now and such important work that you're bringing to life in this world. So thank you you. for being um, the ritual movement we all need right now in our health and wellness routine. Um, Before we go and before I ask you our three questions, uh, give us some tips. You know, we talk about um, self-control and forming healthy habits. What kind of tips do you have for us to kind of kickstart and get going? For sure. This one might sound really um, almost too easy, too obvious, but this is what my research was about as a grad student. And it's to, if you've got a planned event coming up, so let's just, since we talked about, we had a nice sugar tangent today, I will not call it a tangent. That's a really important thing to talk about. A lot of us struggle with it. So say you want, you have a goal that you don't want to eat some chocolate cake at your friend's birthday party tonight. If you know it's happening tonight, you make a plan before you go. So you try to visualize the situation, what it's going to look like, you know, what the cake might look like sitting on the table and you make a plan for yourself. Either that's getting full on something healthy and filling, you know, protein dense before you leave. Um, you make a plan for having lots of water. So you're staying full. You have a plan for what you want to say to your friends when they offer it so that you can acknowledge them grace, grace, graciously for, for offering that to you and, and feel good about that. Or if you plan to have some, give yourself an amount that feels good to you. You know, it doesn't have to be abstinence. Um, I, I work with a lot of people on their drinks for the night because a lot of people entertain clients with drinks and it's like, they feel like they get out of hand. Making a plan ahead of time completely makes life easier. So much easier. Certainly things can go outside of the plan, but the more that you can plan for how you'll react to the obstacles that get in the way of your goals, the more likely that you are to be able to execute. 
Mm, that's excellent advice. I can say a rotisserie chicken and a sweet potato was like the meal I had before every event. So I didn't have to worry about gluten-free dairy-free or a hungry tummy or an excuse that I had a glass of wine. So I had to have the food making a plan. And I love the visualization of it. Those tips would have been so helpful for me as I was really struggling at parties to stay present because all I could do was think about the cupcakes that were going to be there. So thank you for that nugget. So, um, as we wrap up, if you want to contact Rachel, Rachel, where can people go contact you? I'd say the best place is probably just shooting me a DM on Instagram. That's again, the ritual movement. Um, and it's actually, yeah, it's the full word movement. So I thought I shortened it for some reason. So it's just the okay. ritual movement. Great. So you can check her out on Instagram, slide into her DMs as the kids say. I think they're still saying that. I think so. And without further ado, Rachel, what is your superpower? My superpower? I would say, hmm, I'd say I'm really good. And I haven't always been. This is a developed, not a trait superpower, but a, a nurtured superpower has been forgiveness forgiving. Um, and I'd say it started with like family members that I had a hard time forgiving along the way. I know we all have those family members that we'd have a grudge on for something. Um, I'm really, really good at that. Just short, short story. Um, we can dig into it. You can reach slide into my DMS. I'll tell you more. My, my mom and my sisters were out of my life for like 20 years. And back in 2013, I was able to drop my ego and forgive my mom. And now we're like thick as thieves, which sounds like bizarre to even say out loud, but like we talk on the phone like every few days. So forgiveness, and that's finally translated into forgiving myself moment to moment. So I'd say that's become a superpower. That's a great superpower. And I always find that superpowers around forgiveness always start with others. And we always give ourselves the last um, dessert, so to speak of forgiveness. So, um, kudos to you for being able to shine that light of forgiveness on yourself as well. Thank you. What's your purpose? My purpose. So I can tell you like the ritual mov- movements purpose. If you talk so many entrepreneurs, I'm sure that you talk to, it's like your business purpose feels like your purpose too. Um, so I'm just going to go with that because it feels, it feels right to me. It's just to help people feel their healthiest, most empowered self. And to do that in a way that feels really intentional and really embodied, you know, really grounded in their body so they can just get the most out of this life. Mm. Rachel, what's next for you? What's next? Well, professionally, like I said, focusing mainly on working with one-on-ones and really growing that and continuing to refine that process. But after that, I really have a hankering for retreats. I really, now that travel's opened up, I want to take people and put them in an immersive experience where we'll just have access to delicious, nutritious food, where we can talk about all these things in person. We can cultivate community and do it like in the jungle or something. Like I miss that. I've been Mm. on a lot of retreats and I love them. So that is what I'm hoping to create in the near Jungle future. retreat. <laughs> Claim it. What year can we sign up for this jungle retreat? Oh God, putting me on the spot. I'd like to say this year, but Ooh. this 2022 or 2023, it's in the very near future. All right. I love that you claimed it. Thank you so much, Rachel Fisher. Check her out at the ritualmovement.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, go on to Podbean or Apple Podcasts, give us a like, write us a little comment, tell us what you loved about us, share that love on Instagram and find all the newest episodes at Outstanding Women Leaders. And if you want to give a hoot about this owl, you can follow me over at Owl Professional Coaching. Thank you so much, Rachel. I'm going to give you the last word, last word for our audience today. Mm, Go and do something kind for yourself today. Mm.